Hello and welcome fellow audio enthusiasts. My name is Jason and this is Two Channel Listening. Now, I swim up a different stream to bring you often overlooked brands, seldom talked about models, and a lot of the time some darn awesome secondhand bargains that can be had out there that I love to share with my viewership. This week's video is for the birds. More specifically, Meadowlark Audio and its founder, Pat McGinty, with these gorgeous Swifts. Version 2 Swifts, mind you. So, the origin story goes like this. Pat McGinty, from a very young age, grammar school age, his father pushed him to really understand electronic circuits and the family has a history of working in woodworking. This is going to play a huge role later on once Pat finishes college and decides to open up his own business in San Diego. In 1987, Pat opens his business and specializes in very high-end home theater installations, custom installations, and integration in homes. And we're talking some very expensive systems back in those late 1980s. Naturally, with doing all of those custom systems and working with the different drivers and electronics at the time, Pat wants to try his hand at making his own dedicated two-channel audio speakers. In 1994, Pat releases his iconic Crestrel speaker that has timed line drivers and a very complex transmission line. As a matter of fact, he has his own kind of homebrew mass loading transmission line designs, which I will be able to show a picture for you. There is a, an available cutout so that you can see the internal crazy labyrinth of chambers that make up the transmission line speakers within the Metal Lark Audio brand. So, the Crestrel really puts Pat on the audio media radar and he starts to get a lot of reviews and he gets a very loyal following. With that, he starts to make other, other models, including his top of the line Blue Heron speaker. Success really follows Pat and in soon enough they outgrow the San Diego facility. So without growing the San Diego facility, Pat's able to move the entire company up to Watertown, New York. And in the Watertown, New York manufacturing plant, he has all new woodworking machines as well as a very skilled labor set with woodworking in mind. With that, the Generation 2 Metal Lark Audio speakers come out with what we now see is this incredibly complex, very gorgeous hardwood exterior speaker. From a value proposition standpoint, this is an, these are incredible. And the Version 2 in particular, you have a transmission line, sloped baffle floor standing speaker with Scandinavian drivers. And Pat's philosophy is time coherence, time aligned drivers in his own version of a mass loaded transmission line speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, this Swift, these were launched in 2003. Now this speaker you could have in this finish for $1,195. I want that to sink in for a moment. $1,195. Yes, that's almost 20 years ago now, but when you think about what you could have still bought off of a Best Buy shelf for $1,200, doesn't even come close to the value proposition of what the Metal Lark line offered its public. Unfortunately, part of that does come back to bite Pat in a couple of years. So, 
Before getting to that, Pat's top of line speaker, the one that everybody back in the day wanted to own was the Blue Heron 2. And I will show a picture of a Blue Heron 2 with its, its many different faces, including the gorgeous pinstripe. At $12,000, yes, the Blue Heron was not cheap, but when you take it as a whole, with its scan speak drivers, its hard wood, its size, and its frequency response. Looking at the looking at the different audio companies today and looking at the different speaker manufacturers manufacturers today with everything so so much relying on MDF cabinets with extremely thin veneers, you would be incredibly hard pressed to find a strictly hardwood speaker produced today. Now, there's one that comes to my mind, but even its entry-level speaker is well outside of my budget, but I will show a picture of Daedalus speakers out of Washington. Daedalus speakers are a handmade hardwood miter joint speaker, and they have very gorgeous very gorgeous designs with mostly eminence drivers. In 2005, things aren't looking so good for Pat and Metal Arc Audio. Debtors are starting to knock on, knock on the door, loans are starting to come in, and things don't look so well. By April, May of 2005, Pat ends up having to liquidate the entire company, selling off his stock and his machinery, and Metal Arc Audio shuts its doors for good. And what I have on review that has been on loan to me from my buddy Dave at Authentic Audio of Idaho. Dave, if you're watching, as I said, I'll let you have these speakers back when you find me some Crestrel 2s that I can get. There is that really nice pair in Georgia that I pointed out to you. So if you want these back, you're going to have to figure out how to get me that pair from Georgia. What we have is the Swift 2s. These are a 2003. You have a 7-inch wide baffle. It is 9.5 inches deep. Not very deep. It looks much larger than it is. And it is only 36 inches tall. You have both VIFA drivers, these are Denmark drivers, a five and a half inch woofer with a one inch fabric dome tweeter. Now Pat is very strict on using only first order crossovers and I will show pictures of what that looks like. You have one cap, one coil, and one very interesting resistor that I have not seen used in any other speaker. It's more of a chip design resistor. the wrap test. Now for you guys, the other very interesting design with these generation two is while the internal cabinet is made of MDF and the, the baffling or the internal transmission line baffling is MDF, the entire outside, both sides and the front is wrapped in, in full on hardwood while the, the back end has this incredibly nice looking acrylic. And the acrylic is just basically a fascia for that MDF, but for the, the knuckle wrap. Ow. No speaker have I ever had on hand that I have owned has such a damped cabinet. You basically have two full on layers of cabinet on top of the labyrinth of the transmission design wrapped in here for just an incredibly inert cabinet. This tiny little floor standard comes in at 35 pounds and that's basically attributed to all the wood that is in this speaker. Incredible. I would also point out, as you guys saw on my Instagram post, the lovely little bird that's etched into the front. I mean, when it comes down to it, I still, my mind is blown that these were $1,200 speakers as is in 2003 with all this lovely hardwood. Just, you just can't find anything like this these days. 
you know, Salk Sound comes close with very gorgeous veneers, but at the end of the day, it's not a solid wood speaker. And they're, you're paying the price for that as well, for that their transmission line design. So, as far as the frequency response goes, what you have is an 89 dB sensitive speaker. It is a eight ohm nominal speaker, so very, very easy to drive speaker, especially with all of the integrated amps that I have on hand. Frequency response is a purported 35 hertz all the way up to 22K with the Vifa tweeter. Now, as far as the bass goes in that 35 hertz claim, even with this transmission line design, I wasn't coming close to having 35 hertz in my room, even with it cranked up incredibly loud past 85 dB. When doing the bass tests and the bass tracks that I have, it was still very weak below 45 hertz in my room at seven, seven wide and eight feet deep to me. As a matter of fact, with the Ascend with the Ascend Acoustic Sierra 2EX bookshelf speakers, the smallest bookshelf speaker that I have or speaker I have on hand, when I put those Sierras back in right after doing the bass test, there was without a doubt the Sierras give off much deeper bass than the Swifts are capable of. And, you know, I don't know exactly what that's attributed to, the fact that maybe they're over dampened and that there's not enough air space in, my, in the apartment for these to really fill out. But again, I pushed these to 90 dB and I just was not getting anything really usable below 42 Hertz in my room as compared to any of the bookshelf speakers that I have that I've been able to get 39 or better below. So, you know, you know, everybody's miles vary, but for me, that's, you know, that's the honest truth. I just didn't get anything really usable below 42 hertz. Really, I want to say 45 hertz is when I started to actually hear the tonality. Now, having said that, from 60 hertz above, I've never heard anything like these Swifts. I've never heard anything like these Meadowlark audio speakers. Once it carries above that point, these are truly a different sounding speaker. And I gotta get into that and kind of unpackage what that is. So with the tweeter being at, at 32 inches off the floor, because it is a slope design, there's no issues with the tweeters needing to be aligned at my ears. The, the sound stage, is just absolutely, again, very different with these Metal Lark audios. Pushed back into the normal position where I have all of my, where I have all of my speakers at and everything's marked on the floor. To this point, everything I have hand, on hand usually plays, it has this feeling of playing two feet up to five feet forward in front of me. And depending on the amplifier and the speaker combination, there's times where it's almost too close to in my face for the type of presentation that I get. With these metal Lark speakers, it was like everything was five feet behind them. And also appropriately filled in up top so that no point did I have any issue with the tweeters being below my ears? Now, again, for that sound stage, here's, here's the strange thing. I can only attribute this to the fact that since I wasn't getting those lower registers filled in and you didn't have, you didn't have the context of that lower bass, again, everything from 60 hertz up, was so ridiculously transparent. And here's the even weirder part. They were that much more detailed with the lower registers out of the way, not filtering through, 
but there was absolutely zero fatigue factor with these speakers. And that, I think, surprised me. I was expecting, with not having the lower bass notes in there, to balance things out, yet these speakers still managed to be balanced with where they could play in the lower registers and give the most inner detail, again, that I've heard from anything that I have on hand. The Zoo Dirty Weekends being probably as close to spot on to the inner detail as possible, but the Zoos can also give that 30 hertz bottom end that these couldn't come close to. Yet, here's the other part to that, for that inner detail. Here's what I picked up that really made me stand up and immediately write the note down. When Jethro Tull came on with Mother Goose, there was bongos playing in the background, and I remember distinctly that they came from the a little bit right of center. I had never heard them so plainly, so cleanly, so well articulated that I was hearing the skins. That made me stop and go, okay, that's crazy. I, I, I have not heard that in that song to such an extent that I put the zoos back on, my most revealing speaker that I have on hand, played that same. The bongos were there, but they seemed further back and further off and to the right, and they were much more muted. I could hear the bongos, but it just was very muted. Put these back in, play that song again, boom, just right there. You're hearing the skins. It's closer to the center of the sound stage, and it just, it's like right there. It was just, I have never heard that before, that level of detail. And of course, going through all of my normal playlist, playing Melody Gardot, getting the, you know, the double bass lines, which you know, I did have to, again, play it past 85 dB. I'm going to say 87 to 88 dB to actually get those lower registers to show up. The only music genre where I really was able to get some of the bass pushing out of these speakers was the man Hans Zimmer again. When, once playing some of his, his uh, movie tracks, the synthesizers in there definitely worked well with the transmission line. But when it came back to doing percussions with kick drums or any true electronic music, the just the bass lines were not there again you know if we put in say lord royal the song royals there was nothing but just a flapping of the speaker and you could see the vifa driver really trying to pump something out but you weren't really hearing anything luckily there was absolutely no port noise whatsoever in my estimation with my experience with these speakers for the last month these are not these are not bass lover speakers by any means. These are your laid back, acoustical, small ensemble, jazz lover speakers. The, the, the inner detail, the vibrato with strings, the absolute last ounce that I've been able to hear, unlike any speakers that I have on hand and even more detailed, then the zoos without the aggression factor makes them very pleasant to live with on a long-term basis. Now, yes, you could add subwoofers to the mix. You can always add subwoofers to the mix. I prefer to never use subwoofers because I want to experience what the designer had intended with their own design and to make sure that I'm not somehow filtering something out or adding something that might take away from the speaker design itself. So I always listen to all of my speakers without a subwoofer and they are what they are. The presentation is what it is. With the mid-ranging and the voicing, absolutely spot on. As a matter of fact, there's a just right factor that again, I would have to say, beats everything that I have in my room as far as making the, the presenter or the singer sound appropriately sized in the room that I have. Whereas many of these other speakers, 
Eric speakers, the performance ones, or the zoos, they tend to exaggerate and make things sound larger than they are. The person sounds taller. The sound stage is, is much higher, or it's a little bit more forward and in your face. There is, and maybe it's with the time aligned drivers, there is a rightness by the sound stage being pushed back and the, the, the singer more in focus right here that they're, it's intoxicating to go through much more jazz that I have on hand or much more live recordings where there's more focus on those singers. Now there was a bit of peakiness with electronic guitars as some of my viewers know, I'm a major Buckethead fan. When playing anything with heavy guitar riffs, there were some pretty large peaks around the 150 to 200 range that definitely, while going through the chords, all of a sudden a, a lower chord would come out much more aggressive for that moment. And that was kind of a weird anomaly that I experienced while using these speakers that definitely uh, I didn't get with any of the other speakers that I have on hand. So I want to mention that. That could very much be a part of the, the way the transmission lines loaded with this little five and a half inch VIFA driver. As far as the top end goes, the Sierra Acoustic 2EX, sorry, the Ascend Acoustic Sierra 2EX with the ribbon driver has been my tweeter of choice to this point where I absolutely love what it does, the airiness of it, the detail and the finesse. Something again with this Vifa driver with the sloped baffle and the time alignment. Man, I got to say that the, the two of them together, how they present the top end and the air and the detail, while there would appear to be a little bit more extension with the CR2 EX, but gosh, with the, the last level of detail, I have to say that it's a full tie. This VIFA driver in this design against the CR2 EX Bar none, the top end, it's one of my favorite top ends so far of the speakers that I've been able to have on hand and live with for, for several weeks. Again, it's kind of a bummer that you're just going to get so much bass even out of a floor standing speaker, but that mid range and that upper end and the sound stage being pushed five feet back, I've never heard anything like it. I, I say that again. Very interesting in the fact that it makes me absolutely put two other older metal arc speakers on my list. I will have to search out the Crestrel because the Crestrel has the seven inch driver and I'm hoping that with that larger driver, I truly will get more of that 35 Hertz range out of the transmission line. And I would love to report back that, hey, that's an entirely sweet spot in the Meadowlark line. And the reason I really bring this up, folks, is again, my channel's more about, you know, what you can get secondhand at awesome deals that competes with much more costlier modern speakers. I've found two Crestrels so far, one in New York and one in Georgia. There was a gorgeous darker version for $1,200 in Georgia and a, another light, I believe light ash version in New York that was only $750. If that, if that was in Utah and I could ship it, I'd have bought it immediately just to experience, hey, with a little bit more bass and that just intoxicating sound stage. That could be another one of the, that could be another permanent home speaker for me. Now, Pat's a very open guy and at Metal Lark Sings, the new website that he has, I will say right now, Pat's back at it much more quietly and in a much more different uh, design, with much more different design theory. Pat will only build active loudspeakers from this point forward. And with that, his designs, his base model is $8,500 
fully active, going up to the sky's the limit with what he's working on. Pat is a very passionate audiophile. He's a very passionate designer and he is very specific with what he thinks is the best designs. And I will also say Pat is very easy to talk to. He's traded several emails with me and his email is available on LinkedIn. You can connect with Pat on LinkedIn or you can connect with Pat just right there on Metal Lark Sings and send Pat a message. Pat's newest line of active speakers, you purchase the entire package and he uses Class D plate designs in the speakers as well as part of the kit includes the mini DSP SHD module so that you can do Dirac and room correction. Pat is all about active speakers and room correction integration, basically stating that what he's designing now for his diehard customers are their one-time purchase, their forever speaker. That's what Pat's all about. He certainly learned that you know, when you're just a boutique guy, builder, you can't, you know, you can't uh, build these high value, lower price speakers and, and survive based on today's economy. So, you know, with that, expect to pay the price to have your forever speaker when you look at Metal Lark Sings. And I highly suggest you guys take a look at his latest designs and what he's up to these days. In news of other updates, as I had stated in a few messages on my boards, after next week, May 1st, with the Cyrus HD1, I will only produce a video once every other week. That way I have more time to spend with the products, I have more time to do comparisons, I have more time to reach out to the manufacturers and have conversations so that if there's anything that's missing from their material or there's any particular new updates that they'd like to share, I would be able to use that on the video and share that with my list, my viewers. In other news, when I buy these products, when I buy these components and share them with you, just so that you know what struggles that I have, I have the real world struggles with you, looking for the right speaker, purchasing the right speaker, negotiating it, it arriving in good shape and arriving in time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I will also do some other updates if something doesn't work right or I'm really challenged with this product now that I've had it for a while. In a different type of challenge, my warning to Alta Audio owners, you can't be like me that when you buy something and you don't like it and you want to flip it, you're going to lose a lot of money. Sorry folks, but let me just be totally candid. When I bought my Alta IOs, I thought I was getting a pretty good price at $1,750, delivered $1,850. Now those were originally $3,000 speakers, bought them from the original owner from Massachusetts, wasn't crazy about them, and I have been trying to sell them for over two months. I have now dropped my price on them over $500, I'm down to $1,250 and I still cannot give those speakers away at $1,250. When it comes to value propositions, the market will dictate what something is worth on the secondhand market. And I thought it was just, you know, my pain needed to be shared with you guys, especially those out there who can commiserate with buying something you think it's one thing, doesn't turn out to be so, and, you know, that's the challenge of flipping products. You're, there's just sometimes you win and you sell something for what you've bought it for. You get to enjoy it for a period of time and it keeps its value. And then you have brands that just don't keep their value whatsoever. So warning to the Alta lovers out there, be prepared to hold on to that speaker for a very long time or have a model that someone else really wants with the finish that somebody else really wants and is looking for. My silver speakers, 
I can't seem to give those things away. So, you know, I just wanted to share that update with my, my audio community. I'm also open to communications. I put links in the descriptions. If you like the shirts that I'm using or some of the products that I have on hand, you can go to my website and select directly through the Amazon links. And I will also share the different music selections that I use with my tests. I'm open for questions. I get lots of questions from the community. I appreciate answering those questions for you guys and helping people on their audio journey. Until May 1st, I wish everybody a wonderful week. Be kind to everyone. And, and I hope you like my evolving format. Thank you very much, folks.